So now we will try to get to uh, a journalist from Uganda. We have Pamela Mawanda online. Uh, Pamela, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, my question is, uh, when we look at the number of COVID-19 cases in Africa, they seem to be on the rise and uh, so are the deaths. But some countries like Uganda seem not to have any deaths. While the number of cases are rising, the deaths are being reported. And I'm wondering, might you have a reason for this? Is it because uh, the country has a better health system uh, or is it because due to its experience handling uh, disease outbreaks? Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think you are right. The, the situation in African countries is actually quite varied. Um, I think in the last week, uh, about uh, nine countries have experienced an increase of 50% or more in cases. And actually in the last week, four countries have had over 100% increase in cases. Other countries have seen a falling number of cases or are stable. So no more than in other parts of the world we see a different pattern. What we haven't seen uh, so far is very high number of deaths in, in, in any country. And, and that's to be, you know, number one, really welcomed. And it's a credit to the systems in countries uh, that they are picking up cases and are able to treat. Uh, Africa also benefits, as in much of the developing world, the median age, I think, in the African continent, 50% uh, of the population are 18 or younger, and only 15% of the population are actually over the age of 18. Uh, and therefore, the age profile of the population, and if you look at the profile of high morbidity and fatality around the world, that profile has been very much in the older population. So the fact that there are a very low number of deaths may reflect that, but it doesn't, ref it doesn't in any way reduce the chance that the disease will spread. And within Africa, there are many, many highly vulnerable groups, particularly in refugee camps and others, and we need to see the impact of the this disease in more vulnerable people. And we don't know what the impact of this will be in, in undernourished uh, children with chronic uh, malnutrition. We don't know what the impact of this will be in, in overcrowded refugee camps. So there's a lot still to be learned. And we've had surprises. And remember, in other countries, we've had, in some senses, the surprise of the impact in long-term care facilities. We've seen the impact in dormitories in places like uh, Singapore. Uh, this virus can surprise, so we need to be careful not to make assumptions. Um, around that. But again, uh, countries in Africa need to be commended for the rapid way in which they developed testing capacity, trained laboratory technicians, they've utilized their existing surveillance systems, including polio surveillance and, and, and surveillance system designed to pick up uh, childhood illnesses, and they've adapted those to pick up um, uh, early warning syndromic systems to pick up uh, suspect COVID-19. Uh, and we've been working, as uh, many other agencies have, with increasing capacity to treat cases. There are significant gaps in capacity in African countries for intensive care, for the ability to deliver medical oxygen, ventilation, and others. And we're working with um, the EMTs network. We're working within the supply chain network uh, task force which uh, Dr. Tedros initiated a number of weeks ago with WFP and with, uh, with uh, the Secretary General's office uh, to increase supplies of vital medical supplies in, on the African continent. So, yes, on the one hand, good news. The disease hasn't, uh, hasn't taken off in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very fast trajectory, but a concern. Some countries are accelerating in the number of cases. And, yes, there are still many vulnerable people on the African continent. Uh, we will do everything in our power to support countries to reduce mortality in the coming months. Maria. Yes, a short comment to add is in, in that the, there, there are likely a combination of factors of why we would see a difference in mortality, as Mike has outlined, um, you know, the, the proportion of those with underlying conditions, the age profile. But just a, a caveat, the, the deaths and the outcome tend to lag a few weeks in terms of what we know about the case numbers. So as we're seeing cases, there's usually about a, at least a two-week delay um, to when we start to see mortality, we start to see deaths. So um, 
uh, on the one hand, we could be seeing, uh, you know, that people are being identified earlier. You have testing capacities in place. Um, you know, the proportion of people that may develop severe disease could be lower because you have a younger age profile. You have fewer people with chronic conditions like diabetes or obesity or, or, or chronic heart disease. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean uh, that we won't see that later. So we still must do everything that we can in every country even countries that have been successful at suppressing transmission, that have seen a decline in cases, every country right now still needs to be completely ready and vigilant to identify cases, to test those cases, to care for those case cases in medical facilities or in facilities depending on their symptoms, to trace and find contacts, quarantine those contacts, keep your public engaged, keep informing them about what they need to do, ensure that hand hygiene is in place and ensure that we have the facilities so people that can practice hand hygiene, um, that we or, or use an alcohol rub, practice respiratory etiquette. This entire comprehensive package has to be utilized by all countries continuously. So, uh, so just, a, just a warning um, that we are seeing successes. We are seeing countries that haven't yet taken off, and that's wonderful. And we hope that that still remains, but we must remain vigilant.